Good evening, and thank you for joining. Um, before we start, I will just want to dedicate this recital to my dear professor, Professor Al Schoenfeld, who unfortunately can't be here tonight for health reasons. Um, but this is certainly not only because of her work with me, um, but her inspiration of her teacher, Carl Klingler, and Ms. Schoenfeld presenting me with uh, a work that had never been published of his, the Chacon Eagle here tonight. Um, so this is for her. We'll begin. If you say, uh, let me put this down. If you speak of a Chacon to most musicians and certainly to any violinist, they will immediately think of the Bach Chacon, his great work for solo violin, the last movement of his partita. And we will be discovering and exploring that piece later tonight. But first, I want to take a step back and look at the roots of what Chacon is, where, where this dance or where this type came from. And it started not as Chacon, but in Spain as Chacona. In fact, there are uh, indications that it even came from Latin America, across the, across the pond to Spain. But the, uh, the very first indications, the very first uh, record of Chacon is simply in literature and Cervantes and others from the end of the 16th century, speaking of this wildly popular dance that had taken Spain by storm, the Chacona. And it usually had, uh, uh, usually had a refrain about something about the good life. So a very common one would be, vida vina bona, vida vamonos a Chacona. Live the good life, let's go to Chacona. No one knows where and if Chacon, Chacona existed as a place, but this is most likely where the, the dance, where the type got its name. It was just from this refrain. Although some, uh, some scholars think it maybe is just as a reference to the chuck, chuck, chuck sounds of the cassinets that would accompany the dance. But by all accounts, it was a very lively dance, almost raucous. In fact, it uh, ended up being banned from the stage by an edict in, in the end of the 16th century as being too licentious for the general public. So it was certainly one that uh, the public enjoyed very much. To have our first example of any music notation, though, it first travels to Italy and becomes the Chacon. First indications, or rather the first um, writings we have, first uh, notations, of, are simply in guitar strumming techniques. Some, uh, this is transposed into modern notation, but giving simply uh, a rhythm and a harmony. So, for example, this is from a book by book of guitar um, patterns by San Severino in 1620, and all it's indicating is this pattern and this melody. And even from then, we see several core elements of what is to become Chacon. It's a dance that's in three, has three beats in every measure. It has actually this very common pattern of going from the, uh, from the tonic, from one to five, six, and back to five. And by having this short cell of a harmonic structure in this bass line, it lent itself to endless variation, to build on variation chains of just this short cell over and over. It didn't take long until it found its way to the concert stage. Um, one of the most popular chacons from the early Baroque is by Monteverdi. This is the Zephyro Torno. And you'll hear, again, the, the very obvious beats in three um, and the lively nature. Uh, and notice also the presence of this dotted rhythm that, that appears throughout. This will become important.
So you hear certainly the repetitive nature of the harmony, how in this case, every measure, that's a grouping of, of these, three, um, these three beats over, excuse me, over a larger measure. The, this harmony that repeats again and again, um, but this, ri this dotted rhythm, da, 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 that propels it forward, soon became entrenched in, in the very nature of Chacon itself. Um, here's an example even later in 17th century of it becoming entirely uh, instrumental music. So becoming further removed from a peasant dance, a public dance, and more stately, more for the concert stage. You'll hear, however, it's still, uh, it's still in three, it's still in a major tonality, it's bright, and you'll hear that dotted rhythm again. You can also notice, again, that same repetition of the bass line, and yet it's no longer an exact repetition. Whereas in the earlier examples, there was an ost what we call an ostinato bass, where the exact bass is repeated over and over. It starts to take slight variations, even from the, uh, from the first bass to the second. has the, the, certainly the, the repetition, this core theme that is used throughout, we already see that it's, it's different than simply an ostinato bass, simply your Pachelbel canon of, of notes uh, re repeated ad nauseum over which there's variations on top. Next it moves to France, and here we have the word chacon, which is a French word. Uh, it becomes really an established part of a, a, a French tradition of French concert music, um, used on the stage, used in chamber music. Things, it re again, retains being in three. It, it retains those dotted rhythms. Still in major, has the variation chains. But it becomes a, even more stately, even more sedentary. And this is, uh, this is by Jean-Baptiste Lully from his opera Phaeton. And he, by, uh, by and large, became the champion of Chacon in, in France in the late 17th century. That he would use Chacon uh, very often at the very end of his operas or at the end of an act to bring everyone on stage and, and have everyone celebrate the, the, the nature of the opera itself. One, one additional thing I want you to notice besides the dotted rhythm is the fact that it be, the melody begins on beat two, and the dots, the dotted rhythm, dotted quarter, is also a, always on beat two. So you always have a one, two, and one, two, which we can only imagine may have shown up as they were dancing it on stage, but became, again, even a further um, entrenched in the core of, what's, of what Chacon is. So uh, across to the next century, into the 18th century, when Bach decided to use this form as one of many in his, in his partitas, he drew very much from Lully's model. Uh, and we'll see if how, how he has much of the stately nature. He certainly has the dotted rhythm. He has the, the featuring on beat two. Uh, but he, t he certainly takes it much further. Um, and we'll, we'll step back one second and just talk about the works in which that contain this Chacon. It was 1720, and Bach writes not only six solos for unaccompanied violin, but also six suites for unaccompanied cello, 
both of which are strikingly original and strikingly um, interesting or, or uh, unique at the time. If you can read his, in his hand there, six solos, say solo, a violino senza basso accompagnato, for violin without bass accompaniment. And it was key to indicate that since everything, as all the examples we heard, were usually accompanied with basso continuo, with harpsichord, with cello. And so to have these large scale works by the instruments themselves certainly created a tour de force of composition and of performance for those who played it. Things we see throughout, um, throughout these six solos th that make them virtuosic and make them incredible compositions. On a single instrument, he's very often using multiple voices. So whether it's using chords to have four lines, four notes happening at once, and to, and to divide these, the roles of these different voices between um, different notes in the chord, whether it's to give different rhythms and melodies to, um, to the different voices. Sorry. To have different, different activities even that each voice is doing, or to use different violin techniques, such as arpeggiation, to have uh, a chordal effect and that uh, with letting each note move, move in, um, independently while using bow technique to bring more excitement to the piece. So he uses these techniques, or simply just getting the violin to go really fast. As a way of showing off in the same tonality, in the same role, um, the, the limits of the instrument. <clears throat> then when he writes, this chaconne, it's simply, the, it's actually just the last movement of the five, uh, five movements in his second partita. All dance movements with alamand, and courant, sarabande, and cheek, yes. Um, ending, with, ending with the chaconne. And yet the chaconne itself takes on such a life of its own that it's most often played by itself as a standalone piece. It's actually the largest movement he wrote of any piece for any instrument with taking this, again, this simple theme, these simple four measures, doing it 64 times to get an entire 15 minute work of just based on this cell. So he takes this dance that had worked its way through from France and finally to, to Germany and adding not only to the stately courtliness, but adding gravitas and, and um, simply largesse of creating such a, a monumental piece that stretches the limits of the instrument. Notably, he also changes it from being in major to minor, giving it even more gravitas, and it allows him, uh, it, it allows him to have a form to the piece by having one part in minor, going to major, and then back to minor to give an overall arc for this Again, extremely large piece. Let's move forward. Ah. I forgot. We, so you saw in the, uh, we can see embedded in the Chaconne, again, the same bass line as we saw in the earlier, one, five, six, one, simply with some additional notes in between. And while that's the core of it, he uses a lot of variations even of that bass line, as we'll see throughout um, this piece. 
Okay. We move into the mid-1800s after Bach had, as a composer, as compositions, had mostly languished in obscurity. Uh, despite the fact that we hold him to be one of the great composers, uh, it took until the early, early mid-1800s for Mendelssohn to discover and champion this work, uh, his work, rather. Uh, it was in 1829 that Mendelssohn presented his epic St. Matthew Passion oratorio to the German public that really launched a new, a new era of appreciation of Bach. Uh, Mendelssohn is, in fact, credited as giving the first public performance of record of the Chaconne on piano as accompanying Ferdinand David on the violin. So uh, even by yeah, giving a, a very different life to it with, with violin. And then just a few years later, in 1843, the young Josef Joachim, a hung Hungarian violinist, goes to meet with Mendelssohn to audition for him and even to study with him. Uh, he's only 13 years old at this point, 12. 12 years old, uh, but Mendelssohn is so taken by his talent that he takes him under his wing. And it's very soon that Joachim takes to Bach himself, and in particular these six solos. Um, in what one of his students credits Joachim this way. It says, it is one of Josef Joachim's great merits not only to have introduced the sonatas of Johann Sebastian Bach in the concert hall, but also to have made them loved by the, uh, made them loved by the great public. And we can find numerous, numerous uh, examples of his programs where he programs Bach over and over. And in fact, the Chaconne becomes one of the highlights of what he plays. When his students at the end of his career give him a, a festival concert in honor of Joachim as a way of saying thanks. He takes the stage and plays the Chaconne. When he's attending the great Polish violinist Wieniawski, one of his last concerts, and in failing health, Wieniawski can't even finish his piece, Joachim rushes backstage, talks to him, borrows his violin, and gives the audience the Chaconne as, as uh, oh, something for them to listen to instead. There, um, then in 1907, 1908, Bach decided to produce his own edition of the six solos in tandem with the Bach scholar, Andreas Moser. Um, he was the first, interestingly, he was the first to have access to Bach's manuscript. Up until then, there were different copies that people had access to but it had just been discovered of Bach's writing the six solos in his own hand. So Joachim gets access to these and decides to compose his new edition. Uh, interestingly, he, he does so very much um, honoring the, what Bach wrote, but wanting to give also his own interpretation. Uh, Moser, who helped him with this, wrote that the intention was to prepare an edition of Bach's works for solo violin, which should be founded on the authentic text, and at the same time reflect the rendering given this wonderful music by its best interpreter. And we see this in even how it's presented, how it's written, that in every, every one of the six solos, it's given two lines. The bottom line, uh, an accurate representation of Bach's hand, the exact notes, the exact articulations, and the top line with Joachim's interpretation, his bowings, his, his dynamics. And we see uh, how much license he takes um, simply by adding bowings and dynamics, a, a passage that in Bach's original would be becomes decidedly more romantic. 
Uh, he even will add indication of which playing on this string or that to give extra, uh, extra power, extra um, romanticism to the music. So instead of... It becomes... even altering the, the rhythms that Bach wrote. You can see, well, I'll play for you. On, on the bottom, you steady triplets. <laughs> Become, in, in Joachim's writing, these extra, um, with, he adds chords and adds rhythms. becomes adding even new flair, new, new excitement, um, perhaps beyond some of our modern sensibilities, but giving us a taste of what, of uh, their approach to music at his time. So, let's hear in its entirety, Bach Chacon.